Cool. Right, sweet. So I'm talking about exact real arithmetic in Haskell. So this talk is going to have some maths in it, but possibly for the first time it's not going to be category theory or type theory. So that should be good. Uh, but before I say exactly what I mean by exact real arithmetic, there we go. Uh, just a review of the different kinds of numbers we'll be talking about. The natural numbers are just the normal counting numbers, starting from 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, so on. The integers are the natural numbers plus all their negatives as well. So we have 0, negative 1, negative 2, all the way down, and 1, 2, all the way up. The rational numbers are fractions p over q, where p and q are integers. So just the normal fractions that we all know and love. But the real numbers, which is what we're interested in today, are all values on the continuum. So sort of every possible space between all the counting numbers. So as the Greeks famously found out, the rational numbers don't get you there. Not every real number can be written as a fraction like that. So most famous examples are the square root of 2 and pi and e and all that sort of thing. So. OK, cool. So first of all, why would we be interested in real numbers or trying to express real numbers in Haskell? So let's look at floating point numbers. Say we want to solve this reasonably simple linear algebra problem here, where we've got some matrix, multiply it by a vector x, and we get the vector 1, 0 out the other end. So it's not too hard to solve this. We invert the matrix, multiply that, apply that to the vector over there. So here's some just simple code to do that. If we want to solve ax, plus b, uh, AX equals b, we've got our matrix A, the result that we want b, and then if you work out what it is, these are the manipulations you need to do to get that. So here you can see we've got a handful of operations here. There's like less than eight operations that go on to find out the output of our vector, uh, the vector we get as our output here. So you wouldn't think things could go too wrong. So if we go and evaluate the, the problem using doubles, we get this as our vector x, which I don't know seems pretty plausible. But then if you actually go and do it by hand, that's the real answer. And you can see we've got, <laughs> there's not a single correct digit there. <laughs> so, in a handful of operations, we've gone horribly, horribly wrong. Second digit's OK. It's zero. <laughs> I suppose. But yeah, I like that example because most of the things you see in university showing how floating point is bad, they do stuff where, you know, you take one third and you add it a hundred times and you should get whatever. So you've got stuff in a loop or you've got stuff which is really, you know, close to zero or tricky like that. But, you know, that's just a really transparent example. Handful of operations, it's completely wrong. So that problem is one that we could have solved just using rational numbers. But there are plenty of problems that you could come across, you know, trying to do operations on a, operations on a computer that you can't do that with. So an example here is we try to take sine of 2017 times the fifth root of 2. Using doubles, we get exactly minus 1. But of course, that's wrong. The correct answer is that. So using rational numbers is not going to save us here, because we can't, <clears throat> we can't just take the sine of a rational number and try to get some nice answer out. We'd have to use something like floats. and it was seen that it doesn't work. Okay, so what am I not talking about today? I'm not talking about arbitrary precision arithmetic. So we've got arbitrary precision integer arithmetic built into lots of languages that we already use. Like it's in Haskell and Python and Ruby and so on, probably most of the things which we use. So we could take those and we could try to create some sort of arbitrary precision floating point. So this would be equivalent to um, rationals, I suppose, but just doing the normal floating point stuff, except instead of just having a fixed length, fixed size of each integer as the exponent and the mantis, I think it's called, um, <clears throat> we could have arbitrarily large integers. But that still doesn't save us for these things like uh, square root, sine, and pi, which just do not give rational answers at the end. So no matter what we do, we're going to have to be truncating our answer at some point, rounding it, or something like that. And we've seen in previous, previous examples that that can screw us, right? And we might never never know that we've made some sort of rounding error in the middle of our computation. So, <clears throat> what we want is 
some way to represent real numbers exactly. <coughs> so in any system which we could come up with to do this, here are the properties which we're hoping for. Uh, we want to be able to represent any real number or any computable real number exactly so that things like sine and cos and square root and that sort of thing are no longer approximations, they're not like truncated answers, they're just the true exact real answers of that. And then when we run a computation we want to specify how much precision we want to get out at the end, say we want 100 decimal places of this, and then it'll handle all of the intermediate steps. So we don't have to worry about choosing a precision to run our computation with, we don't have to worry about it rounding badly earlier on, we want it to handle all of this for us. So, there are, there are two different systems which have been uh, devised to do this. Uh, there's one using Cauchy sequences and one using continued fractions. So I'm gonna go through both of them, try to give you an idea of how each of them works and talk about you know, the advantages, disadvantages, that sort of thing. So the first system uses uh, Cauchy sequences, which is taken straight from how mathematicians, if you ask them to construct the real numbers, this is how they do it. So this definition is a bit scary the first time you see it, but I'll draw some pictures and hopefully it'll be all right. So a Cauchy sequence is a sequence of rational numbers, uh, x0, x1, so index by i here, so that for any epsilon we choose, for any small value that we choose, there's some point in our sequence n so that beyond that point, our values here are closer than epsilon. So, the only whiteboard is over here. So. Uh, and you could also pull up the board if you wanted to, if you need more space. Uh, yep. Okay, so, say we've got our XI values up here. So say our first value in count of Cauchy sequence is here, and then here, and so on, so forth, like that. So this is index 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Now the condition of Cauchy sequence tells us that for any, for any range epsilon that we choose, like this, there's some point in our sequence, big N, so that beyond this point, all of our dots here are within epsilon of each other. Does that make sense? Cool. So sequences like this are how mathematicians construct the real numbers. So they define the set of all real numbers to be the collection of all of these Cauchy sequences, except we consider two Cauchy sequences the same if they sort of head towards the same point, if their difference can be reduced to zero. So we can define addition by just adding the elements of our sequence, multiplication by just multiplying the elements of our sequence. We can do all the normal operations. So the key here is that our, uh, our elements here are rational numbers, and then by doing this sequence trick, somehow we fill in all the gaps. So we're sort of approaching a point here, even if, our, even if what we approach isn't rational itself. Um, we've fill, filled in all the gaps between the rational numbers. So, one problem with this definition, if we try to use it now, is that it doesn't tell us anything about how fast our numbers approach our limit. So because we're programmers, we're just going to decide that we're going to, oh, we're going to specify that our sequence is approaching uh, the limit real number this fast. So if we take the, the zeroth term in our sequence, then it's closer than 2 to the 0, which is 1. So our first element of the sequence is, is within 1 of our true value. We take the one, the first element of our sequence, it's two to the negative one, so our second element is within one half of the correct value. So as we go further and further along, we're getting closer and closer to the real thing by a factor of two each time. Make sense? Cool. So just an example of what this might look like for some familiar numbers. Um, <clears throat> if we take this sequence of rational numbers, if you go and check the difference between those and the third, it turns out that they satisfy this. So this one's within one, this one's in within one half, one quarter, one eighth, and so on and so forth. And the same down here for pi as well, if you go and work through it. So now, the last change we're going to do before we implement this is you might notice that these um, denominators, down, denominators down here are pretty easy to predict. They're always just going to be the powers of two. So 
our last change before we can go and start writing code is that we're going to say that those are implied. It's, we're just going to assume that the denominators here are always the powers of 2, so we've saved ourselves a, a load of space storing what they are. Cool. <clears throat> so, fast binary Cauchy sequence is a sequence of integers so that when we divide it by 2 to the pth power, we're within 2 to the uh, to the negative p, we're within 2 to the negative p of the real number that we're aiming for. Sweet. So, how we're going to represent this in Haskell is our real numbers are just going to be functions which take a natural number, which is our p, our index in the sequence, and give us back our integer, which is like our approximation at that particular accuracy. So given a real number, we're going to be able to query it by asking it, you know, give me an approximation within, you know, one thirty second of the real number. Um, or in other words, we take, if we query it at p, we know that x is going to lie between these two values here because of the definition of our, our sequence. Okay, so now how do we do math with these? They're a bit abstract. So there's some easy stuff we can start with. For example, if we, if we have an integer, we can turn that into one of these real numbers where if, we, if we're queried at some accuracy p, we just return our integer times 2 to the p. So then when we divide by 2 to the p later on, we get exactly the right value. And it's not even an approximation, it's just bang on what the number actually is. And another easy one is negate. If we have some real number x, and we want a new real number, which represents negative x. If we're queried at some accuracy p, we can just query the old number at accuracy p and negate that approximation. And then we're going to still be as close, just at the negative. Sweet. So now slightly harder is doing arithmetic. So addition, subtraction, and stuff like that. So I'll just have a look at one of them. And then, if you're interested, you can read the source of other ones later on. So, with addition, what we can't do is we can't just take the two approximations at accuracy p and add them together. Because just because a and b are within epsilon of the true value, doesn't mean that a plus b is going to be within epsilon. It would, have to, it would be within two epsilon, which isn't sort of enough accuracy. So what we do here is we query a and b at the accuracy that we want, plus two, <coughs> for each of these. So then when we add these approximations together, oh sorry, I've made some typos here. When we add the approximations together and then divide by four, because we've added these, this extra factor um, two to the two here, we still stay within the range that we need. So if we want to implement this, it's super easy. If we're queried at p, we look at the, uh, we query a at p plus two and b at p plus two, sum them together and then divide by four so we're still at the right scale. So then implementing all the other stuff is sort of still working with this, looking at other tricks to figure out how much extra accuracy we need for doing the true operation, and then dividing out so we're still at the right scale. So the only interesting thing left is the stuff like sine and cos and all that sort of thing, which we couldn't do with floats properly. But we can do them here using Taylor series. So what you learn in a calculus course is that we can approximate these tricky functions using an infinite series of terms like this, adding them together. And the, so as long as we're asking for these things when x is very small, then because we're taking larger and larger powers over here, eventually these get super tiny, and then they can't bring us out of our range anymore. So all we need to do for these ones is figure out when these terms get small enough, and then we can drop the rest of it and sum up the initial part, and we'll have the accuracy that we need. Cool. So, oh shoot. One thing I was just going to do is show that when we use this system, we really do get the answers that we want. So just taking the example that we saw at the beginning. Did 
it up. That's the exact answer to however many places that is, which is pretty cool. It figures out all the intermediate details, so knowing how much we have to evaluate this to, and so on. OK, cool. So that's the Cauchy sequence method. But it does have some disadvantages. So if we want to print something to 100 decimal places, we query the precision that we need, and then we sit there and wait. And then eventually, it'll give us back a huge integer that we can convert into a decimal number. But the problem is, the, whole, the result all arrives at once. We can't tell whether it's making progress. We can't tell how long it's going to take. We just have to wait and cross our fingers. And the other problem is, if we later need 101 digits of precision, then we have to start all over again and query it at a higher precision. We can't take advantage of the earlier, earlier results that we've got. We have to just start all over again. So the second system that I'm going to talk about, the continued fractions, sort of has a way around this, which is pretty neat. OK, so to motivate continued fractions, let's go back and look at how we, as human beings, just write down real numbers. So let's look at pi. Well, pi is 3. Well, <gasps> not quite. <laughs> <laughs> pi is 3 and a little bit. But that's OK, because this little bit is just a tenth of 1, right? <laughs> Except a little bit more. But this bit is just a tenth of 4 and a little bit more. And that's just a tenth of one, and then so on, and so forth. So if we sort of unpack what our decimal notation means, we've got 3.1415, so on and so forth. If you sort of unpack how that works, this is what we're doing. So just for some Haskell code, if we want to take a decimal number, uh, sorry, if we want to take a real number and convert it into decimal digits, we take the integer part by just flooring it, and that's going to be the first term of our sequence. And then the rest of it is just going to be the decimal expansion of what's left over times 10. So if you run this, you, know, you really do get the digits that you want. So doing stuff this way does have some problems. So if we want to write down one third in the decimal expansion, we never finish. Even though rational numbers should really be the simplest numbers we should deal with. We should always be able to do stuff with those easily. If we represent our real numbers as a stream of decimal digits, we'll never be able to do anything with one third. Right? So this gets into the problem of if we wanted to take three times one third, we'd have to read the whole thing before we could tell whether we output one or not. And obviously that's never going to stop. So the next problem is if we tried to do sign of some stream of decimal digits, it's not really obvious how that's going to work. So knowing a decimal digits don't really help you out for figuring out what, out what the sign of a number is easily. But the more philosophical problem is, why did we use 10 when we're calculating what the digits are? So obviously it's because we have 10 actual digits, but so that's not very satisfying <laughs> mathematically. So let's go back and do that again using what they call continued fractions. So we're back to pi being 3, except a little bit more. But now the second part here is just 1 over 7. It's very nearly 1 over 7. Except that's not quite 7. It's a little bit more than 7. But this bit here is 1 over 15 and a bit more. So you can see we're sort of expanding out what's left over in a, in a different way than we were doing in the decimal system. OK, so if we want to see how we do that, the code works pretty much the same way. So suppose we just, like, because that's really real, real unwieldy to deal with, let's just write the continued fraction representation as just a list like this. So the continued fraction for a number is just going to be a list of integers. That's all the type is. If we want to take a real number and convert it to a continued fraction, then <clears throat> if our number is already an integer, then we stop. And our list just has one element. So if our <coughs> If our number is exactly 3, then our continued fraction is just 3 and then nothing else. There's no fractional part to deal with. If there is a fractional part, then we take the integer part and leave it out the front. And then what's left over is the continued fraction for the reciprocal of what's left. So instead of multiplying by 10 and recurring, we're taking the reciprocal and recurring. So here, it's really nice. 
if we're dealing with rational numbers, it turns out that our sequence is always finite. So if we deal with rational numbers, they always have finite expansion. We don't have to worry about the problem with threes forever, so on and so forth. And the rational numbers, of course, which, you know, we still have to deal with an infinite, infinite list, but it's unique at the very least. So there's a unique list that represents, represents each number, pretty much. OK, so now the problem is, how on earth do we do maths with these? Because for example, if we have the continued fraction for pi, it's not really obvious how we're going to get the continued fraction for 2 times pi. It's certainly not just going to be multiplying everything in the list by 2. Because if you think about what that does to the fraction, that doesn't really, really work out. doesn't really make sense. So what we're doing here is following a really ingenious method of working with these things invented by Bill Gosper like in the 80s, I think. So let's look at these functions. So functions of this form. So suppose x is our continued fraction. And we're looking to do something like this where a, b, c, d are all integers. So in maths, these are called homographic functions, so I'm just going to call them homs. Now, our goal here is to invent some kind of function which, given a hom, will apply it to a continued fraction and then give us the new continued fraction at the end. So here it gets a bit ugly. Suppose we know what the first term of our continued fraction, x, is. Suppose we know that x starts with x0 here. So it looks like this. It's x0 plus 1 over the stuff that's left. Yeah? If we substitute that in here, we get this. And after doing some work with it, so just rearranging, just doing nothing out of the ordinary, ordinary algebra, we get this. But what you'll notice is that this is a function which is exactly of the same form as the one that we started with. We've got continued fraction here, and we've got four integers like this. So integer times a continued fraction plus an integer, all over integer times continued fraction plus an integer. So we've reduced our problem of finding this to finding this. So essentially what we've done is we've taken the first term of our continued fraction and we've absorbed it into the home here. So the upshot of all this is if we want to find the home, if we want to apply h to some continued fraction and we know what the first term is, that's going to be the same as applying this home, the one where we've already absorbed the first term, to the rest of the continued fraction. So this is, this is our first fundamental operation we can do. We can take a, ter um, a term and absorb it in. So now the next question is, how can we pull terms out of a home? So say our home looks like this. So when we're working with this stuff, our x's are always going to be positive. So if you look at all the x's in this range, it turns out that no matter what, the result we get out of here has to be between a over c and b over d. So if both of those values have the same integer part, we know that no matter what x turns out to be, our continued fraction is always going to start with Q, our integer part. Because if we take the floor of that, no matter what our z turns out to be, it's always going to be the same. So if we take a home, we can try and emit a term from it. So as long as our c and d aren't zero, we have a look at the integer part of a over c and the integer part of b over d. And if they're the same, we can pull that out. And if it's not, we can't do anything. So then. <clears throat> The final piece of the puzzle is what happens to our home when we pull a value out the front of it. So we've got another slide of maths. Suppose our result is q plus 1 over, one over that. If you work through it, it turns out that if we emit q out the front, we end up with another home with different values, the same way we did when we absorbed something. So now, if you write in Haskell, this is all that happens. So in the same way, we have a new invariant where if we apply a home to a continued fraction, that's the same as pulling a term out the front and then applying the new home after we emit that term to the same continued fraction. So now the only remaining question is, how do we decide which one to do? Now, because we're Haskellers, 
the answer is we just act as lazily as we possibly can. So we try to omit something. If we can, we do it. So we omit. And then we recur and keep working. If we can't omit anything, then we absorb the next term and keep working. And there you go. With those, that simple series of steps, that's all you need to start doing stuff with continued fractions. So if we want to multiply pi by 2, all we have to do is apply this whole, so this is 2 times x plus 0, all over 0 times x plus 1. We apply that to pi, and we get, this should be dot dot dot. We get our new continued fraction for very little work. I have a quick question. Yep. So is the continued fraction for pi just represented as a list, as an infinite list, basically? Yep. And there'll, there'll be some function that produces the, the sequence? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So here I'm just assuming that somehow we already know what pi is yep. forever. Gotcha. So using the home from before, we can do basic stuff with our continued fractions. Like we can multiply them by some number, we can add some rational number to them. But what we really want to be able to do is take two continued fractions and combine them in some way. So we want to add them, or we multiply them, or so on. So what we do is we do all the stuff I did in the previous slides, which I won't do again, obviously. But we do it to this new function here, which has both x terms and y terms. So exactly the same as before, we can emit the term out the front, or we can absorb from x, or we can absorb from y. But otherwise, it works pretty much the same way. But once we've got this, which computes that sort of thing, <clears throat> then we've got all of the maths we could want. Well, most of it. So if we want to add two numbers, we just set up our initial thing, which is 0 times xy, 1 times x plus 1 times y, all over 0 to 0 plus 1, right? And then just by setting up our initial values correctly, we can get all this sort of thing pretty much for free, which is nice. Sweet. So the only thing missing here is how we do transcendental functions. So the same as before, we want to do sine cos. And the way we do this is that we happen to know what the continued fraction versions of these values are. So if we know what x is, the continued fraction for e to the x is this. So the trick here is we just reuse all of the same machinery that we did before to deal with ordinary continued fractions. We reuse it here when calculating these. So to do that, instead of just having continued fractions with integer terms, we have to suddenly deal with continued fractions with terms where each, um, each term here is itself a continued fraction, which is pretty nasty. But it works out really nicely, because if you think back to all the stuff we did with absorbing terms and emitting terms, those were completely general. Like, those would have worked for any, anything which is a num, right? So what we do is that we generalize our home to anything, and we generalize this to just any number type. And then if we have a list of continued fractions, which is like this, a continued fraction of continued fractions, all we need to do to turn it into a normal one is run it through the identity function, and then we're done. Which is really sweet. <laughs> so the main disadvantage of using continued fractions is that, in general, they're just much slower than using Cauchy sequences. But the advantage is that we can stop working in the middle and then resume later on, and it'll keep going from where we were up to. So hang on, let me just see a cool example. So let's suppose our long, tricky computation is just going to be pi to the power of 10. So oh shoot. 
So we could leave this running for a while, but you know, it takes a while to do. So suppose we get up to some point, and then we need to stop for some reason. So I can interrupt that. But now if I restart it again, I just bring the same result. It zooms back up to where we were up to, and then just keeps going straight from where it left off. Which is really cool. All right. So if you're interested in this kind of thing and you want to look up some code, see how it works, there's um, a package which does the Cauchy sequences method uh, on Hackage, the package which is just called numbers. And I looked around for something that did continued fractions, and I couldn't find anything, so I wrote one. So if you want to, if you want to check that out, it's just on my GitHub. And cool. Other than that, some papers to read if you're curious. That's it. talk about yourself and what you do, where you, where you work and what you work on, so. Oh, right. Maybe, um, uh, you just give us a brief speed. Sure. Well, um, I just graduated from Maths at UQ, and this year I'm working part-time at VLC. Okay. So, great. That's me. <laughs> yep. Yeah, with the continued fraction stuff where you can interrupt it and then pick it back up again, yeah. is that by virtue of some built-in memoization in Haskell, or do you have to do something, <coughs> is there something else that you've done that... No, 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 I didn't have to do anything to make that work. Like, that's all Haskell just working by itself. Right. So it's, it's just a lazy list, right? So then when you interrupt, you know, sort of drawing terms from the lazy list, it just remembers everything that you've pulled out of it already. So it just zooms straight up to where it was, and then the sort of the, um, the recursion kicks off from where it left off, which is really nice. Did I hear correctly that Ed was stealing some of your continued fractions work? Yeah. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, well, he's doing even crazier stuff with it. So. Yeah. Nice. Sort of what he does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, what he was looking at is, uh, so when you look at the continu continued fraction of pi, there's no pattern in it really. Like you can look at the terms, there's, you know, nobody's figured out if there's anything nice, like if there's any predictable way to tell what the terms are going to be. But there are lots of numbers where there is a predictable pattern. So for example, if you take the square root of any rational number, it turns out that that continued fraction is going to be periodic. So after a certain point, it'll just start repeating itself. And even stuff like E, like the, the, con the mathematical constant, E, that has a really simple pattern as well, which you could, you know, you don't have to try and calculate it using, you know, tricky things like that. You can just sort of spit out terms because it's really easy. So what Ed was looking at was kind of sort of building in those predictable continued fractions straight into it. So it doesn't lazily try to figure out what the next terms are. It just sort of has some method which it can, you know. Generate. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. So that's what he's doing. So maybe a slightly different direction to me. That's cool. But surprisingly, they're predictable sequences, and yet they're still rational numbers. That's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Doesn't mean that you can express it as a fraction. Okay. Well, so every rational number has a finite sequence. Right. So you can sort of see that by every yeah. time you take out the integer part, the the um, right, okay. the sort of the, turn, the values in your fraction get smaller. So they're smaller periodic, smaller but they're infinite sequences. So, so it's an infinite sequence. It just yeah. happens to be periodic. So do you classify rational numbers which have a finite sequence, and then irrational numbers which have a predictable sequence, and then the real the scary weird ones? ones. Yeah. Are they actually different classes of numbers? Um, so Kind of irrational and really irrational. I've heard the term um, Hurwitz numbers thrown around oh, okay. for the um, for the ones with the predictable sequence. Okay, yeah. but I don't think it's like very well studied or anything yeah. like that. It's, but it's news to me. That's really interesting. Cool. Yeah. How much slower are we talking if we you know, comparing floating <laughs> point operations to? Oh, I haven't actually tried. 
Um, drag right. racing. Sorry? Drag racing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I imagine it's much slower. So you wouldn't want to just use it every day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe for the small size. So are you talking about the continued fractions or the... Um, oh, really. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, so I couldn't, I couldn't tell you. I don't have any numbers off the top of my head. Say. I mean, it's definitely something, you wouldn't want to use either of these systems just in general. Like, you don't want to change your default number in Haskell. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's sort of, it's for special occasions only, I think. Yeah. Oh, the other problem, which I sort of glossed over, is that lots of operations with these real numbers are not computable. <laughs> which sounds bad. <laughs> But which I mean, if you have one of these continued fractions or the cache sequences or something like that, you can't tell whether they're equal because it would take forever to do, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Like for the Cauchy sequences, you have to keep checking the precision for larger and larger values. And even though they're equal the first 100p that you choose, it doesn't mean it's going to stay equal forever, right? So whenever you're comparing these numbers or doing anything like that, you have to choose a tolerance. Like, I'm, like if I want to check whether A is greater than B, I'm willing for it to be wrong if they're actually closer than 10 to the million or something like that. But yeah, comparing numbers for equality or ordering or that sort of thing, you um, you can't do for sure. Is the problem. <laughs> so you get a sequence, but it's not like the canonical sequence for that number. There could be a couple sequences yeah, that are yeah. definitely equal. Yeah. Yeah. Or they um, they're different after a certain point. You can never be sure. That's the problem. Any other questions? Sweet. Cool. Thanks for joining us.